Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome you to today's presentation by Professor Anna Gloin of Stanford University. We are delighted to have her as our guest today for the NHGRI lecture series. And thank you to those of you who have gathered here in person, a very special group indeed, in Lipset Auditorium. But welcome also to all those who are listening virtually. Uh, we want very much uh, to hear from you at the end of this about possible questions you might have as well. Uh, I'm Francis Collins, currently serving as a distinguished NIH investigator in NHGRI. Uh, my lab works on type 2 diabetes, so we're particularly delighted uh, to have a speaker today who has done really groundbreaking work uh, in the genetics uh, of diabetes, uh, Professor Anna Gloin. Before I do a bit more of an introduction about her, just in terms of the logistics, if you are watching virtually, there will be an opportunity uh, for Q&A at the end of Professor Gloin's presentation. For people in the room, I will ask you to use the microphones that are in the aisles so that you can be heard by everybody who's listening remotely. For people who are on the web uh, watching the, the presentation, you can pose questions by going to the Q&A function and just entering your question. At the end, I will serve as the moderator and I will watch for those and um, try to introduce those as part of the conversation just by reading them off in an appropriate way, trying to balance between the virtual questions and the ones from people in the room. So, Professor Gloin obtained her PhD from the University of Oxford and uh, after postdoctoral fellowships with Andrew Hattersley and Franz Machinsky, uh, became herself a significant faculty member at Oxford, working in areas that you're going to hear about uh, in remarkably contributory ways in terms of understanding a lot about the genetics of diabetes. Since 2020, uh, she has moved to the United States, uh, where she is at Stanford, professor of pediatrics and by courtesy of genetics and also associate chair of basic research uh, in the Department of Pediatrics at the Stanford School of Medicine. Her work has covered a lot of ground, and we've had a lovely time already today um, in meetings with her discussing research ideas that relate to that. She's been particularly focused uh, in a very contributory way on monogenic forms of diabetes, which are perhaps less common and less well known by people who don't think about this, but often shine a really bright light uh, into pathogenesis and into genetic pathways that are really critical. And she has taken those apart in very detailed ways to understand not just the genetic variations and mutations, but also the functional consequence of many of those monogenic forms of diabetes. She's also deeply engaged uh, in the effort to understand polygenic forms of diabetes, particularly type 2. Uh, she has, I think, distinguished herself by being a very collaborative investigator who has worked very hard uh, to make sure uh, that the information being derived by herself and others uh, can be utilized in a way that uh, it adds uh, to the overall knowledge base of this puzzling condition. Um, she is, by the way, part of what we call a dream team of the Accelerating Medicines Project, uh, looking specifically at, at diabetes, funded by both NIH and pharmaceutical companies. If you've looked at her publications, you will see a, a lot of very cutting-edge material in prominent journals, and I suspect there's a lot more that we haven't seen in publication yet, and you'll be hearing something about that today. She's also, um, I think, a remarkably dedicated mentor uh, of many trainees. I had the privilege of co-mentoring with her a few years ago, one of the OxCam uh, graduate students, Matt Rees, and that was a wonderful experience where uh, having that student together uh, brought our labs closer than we would have been, and that has been maintained ever since. So again, a wonderful personal privilege to be able to host her here today. Please join me in welcoming Professor Anna Gloin. Well, thank you so much, Francis, for that wonderful uh, introduction. It's an absolute pleasure to be here today and to meet in the flesh people who, over the course of the last four years, I've seen in 2D variety in Zoom. Um, and I'm really looking forward to sharing with you uh, this afternoon some of the work that my lab has been doing over the last few years. 
Um, I like to start with this slide, which has got a wonderful representation of women in science. Um, this is artwork by Rachel Igontowski, and you can find beautiful books that you might want to share with the uh, younger members of your family that depict women who've made contributions to science throughout history. So uh, as uh, you've just heard, uh, for a very long time, I've been absolutely fascinated by pancreatic islets in the pancreas. And these are a central uh, microorgan uh, that is responsible for secreting the hormones that control blood glucose levels. And there are lots of different things that can affect them that cause them damage and result in a failure of these uh, cells to secrete uh, insulin in response to glucose and other secretagogues. And there are many different ways you can damage them with uh, glucose exposure, lipids, cytokines, viruses, drugs, and of course, uh, genetics. And the way that these uh, insult on this tissue results in a failure of the beta cells to maintain themselves and to make and secrete sufficient insulin to control blood glucose levels. And this can happen through a variety of different uh, mechanisms. It might be through defective development, it might be through a loss of beta cells, perhaps through autophagy and ER stress, or you can make those beta cells, but part of the machinery that's critical for how they uh, respond to glucose and secrete it is effective. And of course, when any of these insults happen and you uh, reach that sweet point where you have insufficient cells or insufficient cells that are functioning correctly, you end up with uh, elevated blood glucose levels and one of the uh, varieties of diabetes. So my lab really has championed the fact that if we can learn from Mother Nature, if we can look at those genetic variants that alter islet function, we can use this as a lens to study the pathways that underlie different varieties of diabetes. So ever since I was a PhD student, and I'm afraid to say this was close to 30 years ago, I've really tried to use common genetic variants that increase your risk for developing type 2 diabetes, or rare mutations that are causal for monogenic forms of diabetes, and to use these as tools to interrogate those cellular and molecular mechanisms that underlie islet dysfunction in diabetes. And I've really wanted to use that information, not just to understand about new biology, but to take it into the clinic, to have some translational relevance. Now, that might be through precision medicine. It might be through the identification of safe and effective targets for uh, therapeutic development, or perhaps an area of growing promise in patient stratification. So one of the uh, best examples I uh, feel that demonstrates that working with human genetics is likely to be a successful endeavour in terms of these goals is work that I had the privilege to be involved in as a postdoc working with Andrew Hattersley when I was in Exeter. And during my time in Andrew's lab, I couldn't really let go of the KTP channel that I'd spent four years working on as a PhD student. And I'd been looking at common variation in that gene during my PhD. But I always wondered whether or not there were rare variants in that gene that could give rise to a more severe form of diabetes. And that turned out to be the case when I sequenced this gene in children with a rare variety of diabetes called neonatal diabetes. And children like Lily, who's shown here on this slide, have a heterozygous activated mutation in this gene. And building on the work of Francis, um, uh, 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 Francis Ashcroft and others, we were able to uh, hypothesize that the mutational mechanism would be a failure of the channel to respond, in, uh, respond to ATP generated from glucose metabolism, and that this could be uh, 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 rescued by treating with a class of drugs called sulfonylureas, which were already known through their use in treatment of patients with type 2 diabetes to close the channel by an ATP independent mechanism. And this turned out to be the case, and now if you have a mutation in this gene identified as the underlying cause of your neonatal diabetes, the uh, uh, first line treatment is a sulfonylurea rather than an insulin injection. So this is a really nice example, I think, of precision medicine, where finding the underlying genetic etiology alters uh, the way that your doctor chooses to treat your diabetes. And it's also an excellent example of how human genetics can take us to safe and effective therapeutic targets, because after all, the sulfonylureas were already being used to treat patients with type 2 diabetes. 
So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about uh, the experience of uh, identifying for the first time a new genetic uh, disorder, I had uh, the privilege of talking with Maggie Shepherd and Andrew Hattersley uh, in November last year for a podcast that they've been releasing. It's called One in Six Billion. The QR code is here. And we had a really wonderful trip down memory lane. You can also listen to some of the patient experiences uh, of being treated for this variety uh, of neonatal diabetes. And it really is a wonderful uh, 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 opportunity to really hear about the impact of human genetics on uh, clinical care. So uh, this afternoon, as I take you on a journey through islet biology and human genetics, uh, you're going to be entertained along the way with some wonderful illustrations of uh, female scientists. I've already started by showing you uh, some of the beautiful illustrations from Rachel uh, that depict famous scientists from history. One that I wanted to uh, draw your attention to is Mary Anning. Uh, I'm from the UK originally, and Mary Anning uh, was the fossil hunter on the uh, south coast. Uh, so on trips down to the beach in the summer, we would see uh, her museum and also see her uh, uh, gallery where you can go in and learn all about her. But it's not just about the women from history, it's all about you in the room and the uh, scientists of the future. So I'm going to share with you as well some illustrations of what pupils from Headington Prep School in Oxford think a scientist should look like. Uh, these uh, wonderful girls from the ages of 4 to 11 will uh, show you what they think a scientist uh, should be. Uh, some of these are absolutely beautiful and then at the end there are some that are a little more concerning and we can talk about those. So what do we know at the moment about the genetic landscape for type 2 diabetes? Well, we know about 50% of the genetic risk for type 2 diabetes. This is a, a schematic representation of uh, the journey that we've been on since the uh, uh, 2000s. Uh, across the bottom, you can see PubMed IDs for studies that have been either candidate gene or linkage studies in red, uh, GWAS and a Metabo chip through to uh, sequencing studies closer to the end here in green. The bigger the circle, the more uh, loci were identified, the more purple you see, the more uh, sample was from a European population. So a couple of things to note. You can see, first of all, that we've done terribly well in recent years through GWAS and have got now over uh, 667 independent signals. Uh, this review is already out of date, uh, a note of caution to trainees, because uh, a wonderful work from uh, the Diabetes uh, Genetics Initiatives has just been published in Nature, and we now have another 154 to add to this figure. What you'll also notice is that we have done a pretty poor job at sampling outside of European populations. And I know that this is an area that many now are trying to close the gap on, but clearly something that we need to do as a priority to make sure that we don't uh, contribute to health disparities. Again, I just wanted to sort of put my own personal uh, flavour on this slide and to show you that here back in 2000, this was my PhD project and this was uh, identifying that uh, common variation in that KTP channel gene contributed to type 2 diabetes. But look at what's happened just over the course of uh, my career through these wonderful collaborations around the world, including many with uh, Francis Collins and team in the room. So... We've got all of this wonderful information, all of these clues into the biology of diabetes. So what's been the barrier? Why has it been so hard to move from those genetic variants to new insights into uh, biology? Well, the reason for this is true for many complex uh, traits and disorders. Most of the variation that we found doesn't sit neatly in the protein coding space, like the variation that I found in Lily that was responsible for her monogenic form of diabetes. Most of it is in this non coding region of the genome, which is presumed to have a regulatory function. And this leaves us with huge ambiguity over whether or not a variant is influencing gene A, gene B, gene C, or perhaps a combination of these genes. And of course, gene regulation is really complex. It's not the same in every cell in the body, and it's not the same at different time points, and it can change when we stimulate cells. And all of this makes it very, very difficult to go from that first genetic change to linking it to uh, the protein that you want to study and perturb in the laboratory. So what I thought I would do this afternoon is really try and give you three vignettes, three different ways that we've been trying to close this gap between genetic discovery and biological insight. And I personally find it easiest to, to do that by 
putting it around a story, something that you can see uh, and understand how we go from start to finish. So I'm going to tell you three stories. The first one is where we take a shortcut, where we ask whether or not there are any coding variants that are causally related to diabetes risk. And we use these as molecular signposts that take us straight to the protein that we want to study. And I'm going to tell you about some recently published work on a transcription factor called PAX4 and take you through how we've studied what that particular coding variant it does to PAX4 function. I'm then going to sw uh, switch gears and move from working on a single locus to trying to accelerate our ability to understand what happens when you perturb genes at scale and to generate large resources that can be combined with other data types like genomic data and genetic data as a way of accelerating our ability to work out the underlying effect of transcripts. And I'll do this through sharing with you some recently published work on a CRISPR screen in human beta cells. And then I'm going to finish up at the end of my talk with some completely unpublished data. And I'm going to talk about a really exciting project that's a major focus of our lab at the time. And it's been a project that we've been setting ourselves up to do for over 10 years. And this is where we're trying to leverage uh, a pretty unique resource that we have in collaboration with Patrick McDonald at the University of Alberta in Edmonton to perform a GWAS in a dish to identify novel uh, regulators of insulin secretion. But just before we move on to section number one, take a moment to appreciate this beautiful illustration of a scientist, look at this wonderful tidy bench, and atten attention to health and safety. This scientist can come and work in my lab anytime. So part one. So the first part is going to be about coding variants as molecular signposts, and I'm going to tell you about some recent work on a really fascinating signal in the PAX4 gene. And this is where we've got certainty over the gene that we want to study, which gives us a huge advantage as we start to move forward with unlocking the biology. So back in 2016, uh, part, as part of the Type 2 Diabetes uh, Genes Consortium, this was one of the first studies that performed exome sequencing in around 13,000 individuals, of around half of whom had uh, Type 2 diabetes and half were controls. And these were drawn from five different ancestries. And this really gave us the first look at the uh, role of coding variants in diabetes risk. There were some that were completely responsible for a signal, others that were tagging a signal, but these were uh, opportunities to go in and think about the biology. And I would say that my lab really made it our business to go after this low-hanging fruit. We thought we saw this as an opportunity to accelerate our knowledge in a way that wouldn't be as painful as trying to link those uh, regulatory variants to the underlying genes. And if you look across this Manhattan plot, you'll see that there are lots of different types of protein here. We've got zinc transporters, we've got transcription factors, iron channels, we've got uh, enzymes and regulatory proteins. So lots of different types of protein that you'll need to interrogate in uh, the lab. I wanted to also highlight uh, the wonderful work I was involved in with Dr. Collins, where we had this uh, fantastic uh, um, NIH um, CAM grad student, Matt Reese, and we were re really able to do a very deep dive on the GKRP locus. And this was unusual for me because it's not in the islet. Uh, so this took me into the liver, but it was a really wonderful uh, collaboration. And here Matt is um, defending his thesis with St uh, Sir Steve O'Reilly and Dame uh, Kay Davis. Matt is now at the Broad and doing fantastic work on uh, cancer biology. But today, we're going to focus in on this transcription factor, PAX4, and a specific coding variant in this gene, R192H. Now, this is a very interesting signal because it's pretty much limited to Southeast Asians. We didn't find any carriers of this variant in the European population. And in the Southeast Asian population, it has a pretty impressive odds ratio of 1.79, which is pretty close to TCF7L2, um, uh, one of the first signals that we uh, identified. Now, this transcription factor, we know a lot about it in mice, and from some uh, studies from the uh, 1990s, we know that in mice, PAX4 is essential for making a pancreatic beta cell, and if you lose two copies of the uh, PAX4 gene in a mouse, the uh, mice die on day three. So clearly, a uh, very good reason to believe that PAX4 is important uh, for uh, pancreatic beta cell biology. 
But one of the things that we've learned through human genetics in recent years is that you can't always extrapolate what we found in a mouse to uh, what happens in a human islet. There are some pretty major uh, differences. In uh, both mice and humans, though, we know that uh, the pancreatic islets are made up of a number of different cell types, including the pancreatic beta cells that are responsible for making and secreting the hormone insulin that is glucose lowering, and the pancreatic alpha cell, which are responsible for making and releasing glucagon, uh, and this is glucose raising. And from beautiful studies from a number of groups in mice, we know that the transcription factor PAX4 is critical for uh, making beta cells, and that it seems to have this reciprocal uh, arrangement with another transcription factor, ARX. And it's the uh, reciprocal repression of these two uh, transcription factors that controls whether or not an endocrine progenitor cell becomes a beta cell or an alpha cell. So can we make that leap that this is also happening in humans? Well, I think not, because we know from beautiful work from many groups now that there are fundamental differences between rodents and humans in both the architecture of an islet, the uh, flavour and variety and distribution of ion channels and uh, glucose transporters, how we govern cell cycle control, and also the transcription factors that are important for uh, pancreas development. And there's a beautiful example from monogenic diabetes where the phenotype of GATA6 in mouse has no diabetes phenotype, but in humans, if you lose one or two copies of this, you end up with uh, diabetes. So is PAX4 essential for beta cell development in humans? And do these two transcription factors, uh, PAX4 and ARX, reciprocally repress one another to determine cell fate? So when we uh, set about to tackle this, we appreciated the fact that this is a variant that's not present in the European population, it's exclusively in Southeast Asians. So we were very fortunate through an existing co uh, collaboration in the type 2 diabetes genes community to work with Tai Shong and another uh, scientist, a stem cell biologist, Adrian Tio at the ASTAR Institute in uh, uh, Singapore. Huey was a first year PhD student at the time and Nicole Krentz was a, a fresh new postdoc in my lab. And across the two teams, we decided we would try and tackle this using a variety of different approaches. We thought it would be interesting to recruit by genotype and understand the effect of this coding variant on uh, glucose homeostasis in humans. We thought it would be uh, prudent to try and understand what happened when you lost the entire PAX4 gene in terms of your ability to uh, make beta cells in a dish. And given the fact that we had access to people with the uh, variant, we thought it would be uh, sensible to look at patient-derived uh, stem cells and uh, be able to correct the mutation and see what the ability of the cells were to differentiate in a dish. And those of you who work on uh, islet cell models will know that the best we can get in a stem cell model is a pretty immature beta cell. So we thought it would be prudent to uh, add to our collection of tools the human field derived beta cell model endoc beta h one as a much better tool to look at any functional consequence of loss of this transcription factor. So here we could study uh, development of the beta cells, function of the beta cells, and how they uh, worked in terms of uh, hu whole human physiology. Now, this was a long uh, uh, project over many years, and uh, Nicole, at the time that the paper came out, was already faculty at UBC. I'm excited to say that the Krentz lab is now open. And uh, Huey is now Dr. Lau. So I think this really illustrates the... Uh, person hours that go into a, a project of this undertaking. And I see smiles in the room, so I know others appreciate uh, the, the task at hand. So let's start off um, by working our way through these different experiments. And on the uh, left of my slide, there's a little schematic here that points to where we are in our journey. So we're starting off with human physiology. So with Yi Shong and his clinical collaborators, we were able to recruit 183 individuals for an intravenous glucose tolerance test. And this was a way that we could look at uh, the, their ability to lower their glucose levels um, with secretion of their own insulin. And through doing that, we could show that the uh, carriers of the PAX4 type 2 diabetes variant had reduced acute insulin response to glucose. We could also show that they had reduced beta cell uh, function 
as measured by something called HOMA B. This is a very well established tool of measuring beta cell function from a glucose tolerance test. In 57 individuals, we invited them to come back in for an oral glucose tolerance test. So the difference between these two tests is whether you drunk your glucose drink like Lucozade or whether you had it injected intravenously. If you look below, you can see that if you uh, have the uh, PAX4 uh, variant, you have elevated fasting glucose, elevated glucose levels two hours after taking the glucose drink, and you have a reduction in your area under the curve for insulin. So all of these human physiology data point towards the fact that if you have one of these type 2 diabetes risk alleles in the PAX4 gene, you have reduced pancreatic beta cell function. So that's good. It makes sense. This is what we hypothesize. It's a transcription factor. It's involved in uh, pancreas development. And we see that this uh, manifests in carriers who are all non-diabetic, I should add, uh, as an uh, effect on beta cell function. So let's move on now to think about what might be driving that underlying beta cell dysfunction. Let's try and model it in a dish. So we started off with uh, an isogenic uh, st uh, stem cell line that we've worked on uh, through the Stem Bank Consortium. And we used CRISPR to uh, cut out the PAX4 gene. And then we looked to differentiate our CRISPR shams, our unedited uh, wild type cells, and our knockout cells through, and we actually did it through two different differentiation programs protocols, one in Singapore and one in Oxford. But for simplicity, I'm just going to present one of the uh, data sets this afternoon. So when we differentiated uh, the cells uh, through our uh, protocol in Oxford that's based on the Rosania uh, protocol from Tim Kiefer's lab, you can see that the highest expression of PAX4 comes on here in the pan uh, uh, pancreatic endoderm stage, and you can see in blue that our knockout uh, was successful. If you look over here at our transcriptomic data from the, our stem cell-derived islets that are here at the end of the differentiation, you can see that we start to see uh, derepression of glucose uh, an alpha cell marker, and we see also an elevation of FEV1, which is a, a transcription factor recently described by Julie Sneddon as really important in lineage determination uh, for uh, uh, islet cell development. So our data here, which was also uh, seen in our Singapore sample with a different uh, same cells, different protocol, we see a derepression de of alpha cell genes in our stem cell derived islets. So again, supporting an important role in uh, cell fate uh, for PAX4's uh, presence in the beta cell. So what about if we then looked at a little bit more uh, closely at what these uh, cell, cells look like? So these are data now from uh, donor-derived uh, cell lines taken from fibroblasts that were reprogrammed. Uh, we have them from uh, individuals with uh, uh, wild type, uh, heterozygous and homozygous, and the number of carriers as underneath. And all of these cell lines were uh, differentiated in a single experiment. And we were then looking at the uh, insulin and glucagon expression in our stem cell derived islets. And what you can see is that if you carry a copy of the type 2 diabetes risk allele, you have an increased number of bihormonal cells. You can see that here from some uh, depictions in our IF, but also in quantification over here on the uh, right hand side. In addition to having a, a higher number of bihormonal cells, we also saw less insulin content. So individuals who have one of these type 2 diabetes uh, raising uh, risk alleles have more cells that are positive for both insulin and gl um, glucagon, and they have less insulin overall. So um, we thought then, well, that's great. We can get a good sort of uh, quick look at what's going on here. But what might be the... Um, transcriptional networks that are responsible for this uh, difference in cell fate. And this was really where I have to have all respect for Huey, who set about to take 12 uh, IPS lines in triplicate and to do this in a single experiment without a robot. Uh, I add that for Mike Erdos if he's listening. Um, uh, I'm not sure Nicole would have taken this on, but Huey, hats off to her. So um, you can see here we collected cells at the uh, IPS stage, at the pancreatic endoderm, endocrine progenitor, and at the islet stem cell-like stage. These were then uh, uh, prepared for RNA-seq, and you can see here in the UMAP that they separate out based on their time and differentiation. When we look at the different differentially expressed genes between uh, the genotypes, we see the greatest difference at the endocrine progenitor stage here. Um, and when we look at the uh, 
pathway analysis that we can see that uh, the pathways that come up are to do with metabolic processes, um, cell metabolic processing, and cell response to stress. And given these indications, we thought it would be sensible to look at the metabolic features of our stem cell-derived uh, uh, islet-like cells. So we turn to the seahorse as a way of looking both at um, uh, glycolysis and, also, and, uh, and oxidative phosphorylation. Um, and we could capture this uh, through either measuring uh, oxygen consumption or the acidity of the extracellular uh, reagent. So you can see here that we have uh, an effect on glyco uh, glycolytic capacity and glycolytic reserve. And when we look at mitochondrial uh, metabolism, you can see here in terms of oxygen consumption rate, we have a switch from glycolysis to oxidative phosphorylation. So this shows that the transcription factor uh, pathways that we had noticed were differentially uh, regulated between people with and without the variant were then manifesting as defective, um, defects in metabolism in our stem cell derived islets. So we've got at this stage evidence that having either a loss of Pax4 or a type 2 diabetes raising um, a risk var variant in your Pax4 gene has an effect on your ability to make uh, a, a, an authentic beta cell. Can we now go in and correct the uh, variant and rescue the phenotype? And of course, that's one of the beauties with CRISPR is that we can't, we can not only knock out genes, we can also make uh, single base uh, edits. And here, using homology directed repair, we were able to re, uh, rescue uh, the uh, phenotype by correcting. Uh, the mutation in uh, patient-derived stem cells. And in doing this, we could rescue both the uh, bihormal cells and also the insulin content. So this really shows that it's that uh, single amino acid change that is uh, the, re the reason why we have got the phenotype in uh, this uh, uh, cell population. So everything I've shown you up until now has been in a stem cell derived model and we've been really focusing on these immature cells. But what if we then moved into a, a more mature beta cell model and started to think about how well those cells secrete insulin? So we turned our attention to the endo C beta H1 cells and we did two different ways of uh, silencing the uh, Pax4 transcript. We did a transient uh, transfection with siRNA and we also did a lentiviral transduction with S SHRNA. I'm just showing here the results of the siRNA, but both experiments gave the uh, same uh, uh, data. So you can see that we were able to uh, uh, reduce uh, Pax4 expression, and you can see that this had an effect on uh, both insulin secretion in terms of the stimulation index and in the amount of insulin that we were able to measure within our pancreatic beta cell model. So Pax4 is a transcription factor, and the variant that's associated with diabetes risk sits in the homeo domain of this uh, transcription factor. And we know from the work of uh, others that it's a Pax4 is a repressor of both the insulin gene and the glucagon gene. So in luciferase assays, we were able to study the ability of the variant form compared to the wild-type protein to repress both insulin and gene uh, promoter activity. And we could see equal repression of of the uh, insulin promoter, but you can see here we see reduced repression of the glucagon promoter. So consistent with us having an increased number of bihormonal cells and a derepression of uh, uh, alpha gene signature. So let me summarize this first part of uh, the, the talk. So I've taken you through some work where we've studied a, a variant that's exclusively found in the Southeast Asian population. And we've studied that variant in humans who carry it and showed that it has effects on their beta cell function. We've looked at isogenic and patient-derived iPS cell models and also the endo c h one cell models and have shown that those uh, type 2 diabetes risk alleles reduce insulin uh, secretory capacity in vivo and lead to derepression of alpha cell genes in, re in vitro. So if we take this together, I think what we can conclude is that Pax4 is not essential in humans for beta cell development. We've still made beta cells and our individuals with the variant have beta cells but they do have uh, an increased risk of developing diabetes, most likely through disturbance of this uh, reciprocal uh, arrangement between Pax4 and ARX in governing the cell fate of an endocrine progenitor cell. 
So that was focusing in on one locus and really doing a deep dive over many years using a multiple uh, uh, approach with many different uh, model systems. I now want to sort of talk about the opposite experiment, which is really trying to do everything at once in one experiment and not going very deep. So here, this is a CRISPR screen in human uh, beta cells. We've used the same endoc beta h one model that's derived from human fetal pancreas. And I want to show you how we've used those data uh, to integrate it with uh, genetic data to prioritize signals at type 2 diabetes GWAS uh, loci. And this is me, by the way, over here um, in my nice high-heeled boots. So let me introduce you to Antia Rotner. Antia was a PhD student in my lab in Oxford, and her PhD uh, project was uh, about doing this screen. And this was a pretty Herculean task, and when I uh, approached her about whether or not she fancied doing this as a project, um, I don't think either of us had really worked out what she'd uh, taken on. We decided that we would work with the Toronto Knockout Library. At the time, people were really favouring the Gecko Library, but there were lots of reports of off-target effects. So we settled uh, on the Toronto Knockout Library. This has 18,000 genes with um, four guide RNAs per gene and around 150 control guide RNAs within the library. Our idea was to get this into endocbtrh one cells uh, with pyramycin selection um, so that we had one guide RNA per cell. And what we were looking to achieve was to set up an assay uh, that would uh, measure the amount of the hormone insulin in the beta cells. And we would be able to uh, separate using flow cytometry uh, cells into two populations, populations with a lot of insulin and a population with less insulin isolate the DNA from those uh, cell populations, uh, sequence it, and then map the guide RNAs back to the population of cells that they were in. The idea being, if you uh, saw more of a guide RNA in this population than that, you would assume that that guide RNA was responsible for uh, reducing insulin secretion. So this is a very simplistic overview of what we've done. There's obviously a lot more nuance to it and a lot more detail, and if you would like those details, uh, please look at the paper. Today I'm really going to focus on the high-level uh, summary of, uh, of this effort. Okay, wait for it. So, for this screen, it required 700 million cells. That is a lot of cells. This is a cell line that only divides once a week. Um, and it took Antia four months to uh, uh, grow the cells up to a sufficient number that we were able to do this screen. We did it twice. So you can see here that by the end of the four months, poor Antia was spending 12 hours a day at tissue culture to split the cells. I felt such a cruel supervisor. But thank goodness, uh, after uh, a lot of effort, she was able to identify 580 genes which influence how much insulin you have in a human beta cell. And that 580 is probably very conservative because we were very careful with our analysis to make sure that we uh, were confident with what we kept in. Uh, and in doing that, we've probably thrown things out that are real, but we felt that that was uh, the better way to go with our analysis. Happy to talk more about that. Now, if you want to know if your gene that you're interested in uh, when knocked out in a human beta cell line alters insulin content, we've made all of these data publicly available through the AMP Common Metabolic Disease Knowledge Portal. Many thanks to uh, Maria Costanazo, who put the data up for us. You can search in your gene and pull it up. And uh, here is a link to the paper and to, uh, also to this uh, website. And you can also find the raw data if you would like to download it, reanalyze it, because perhaps you want to do different cutoffs uh, and look at the uh, data differently. It's all out there, all you're there to use. Please do use it. What do we do with our data? Well, we started this by thinking, wouldn't it be great if instead of going off and doing a gene knockdown to see whether or not it affected insulin secretion or content, we could just do a lookup? So we took a curated list of genes uh, that had been put together by many experts in the, uh, in the field, particularly Mark McCarthy and Anuba Mahajan, through the uh, Type 2 Diabetes Knowledge Portal. And we intersected this list of 336 potential uh, effector transcripts with the 580 genes that Antia had discovered. And in doing so, we had this intersection of 20 genes where there was evidence from the genetics that they could be underlying uh, a GWAS signal, and there was evidence from our screen that when you perturbed them, you had an effect on insulin secretion. 
And these were linked uh, with different flavours of confidence, you know, so some of them we were absolutely confident it was causal, others there was no evidence and some there was possible. And we thought it would be most interesting to focus on the ones where we had less evidence that uh, they were involved in beta cell function. So we honed in on something called CalCoCo2, CalCoCo2 being a gene that none of us had heard of in the context of uh, pancreatic biology, but yet our screen had shown that it was a regulator of insulin in content. Quick look in the literature and you'd find that it was associated with mitophagy, mostly following uh, infection, uh, but nothing there about what it might be doing in terms of metabolism. So we followed this up in, in, in quite a lot of detail. Um, I'm showing here a small amount of our follow-up data that was really championed by a talented postdoc, Ying Yi, from uh, 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 Lund University, who came over uh, just, before, uh, just after COVID to do this work. And you can see that she was able to demonstrate in endo cb h one cells that when we silenced the CalCoCo gene, we saw uh, not only a, a reduction in total number of uh, insulin granules, but also we saw a difference in the phenotype of those granules. It seemed that uh, the targeting of the removal of the granules was really focused on immature granules. So there was a higher proportion left of those reduced granules of ones that had the mature phenotype. So where are these granules going? Well, looking at our EM in a bit more detail, uh, Ying Ying observed that there, were, uh, there was evidence of autophagy and vacuoles, so she started to test this more formally using uh, LC3 uh, staining and was able to show that there was evidence in CalCoCo knockdown for increased uh, autophagy. In our first paper, uh, we uh, didn't detect any effects on mitochondrial function. We'd measured ATP in a plate uh, assay and saw no differences. But since publication, we've really uh, looked at more carefully at these unusual mitochondria that we're also observing on CalCoCo loss. You can see here they have altered uh, uh, Christy. And uh, Yong Hyun Lee, a new postdoc in the team, has used the seahorse to really study this in more detail. She has replicated what uh, Ying Ying saw, that there's no effect on ATP production, but we see striking effects on maximal respiration and on spare respiratory capacity. And to me, this makes a lot of sense because if we now challenge these beta cells, they're going to be in a uh, unhealthy position and unable to step up to the task of performing the function of a pancreatic uh, beta cell and uh, 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 metabolizing glucose and releasing insulin. So to summarize part two, uh, I've told you about our genome-wide CRISPR loss of function screen in a human beta cell uh, model where we uh, used insulin content as our cellular readout. We identified 580 genes which influence insulin content and 20 potential effector transcripts at GWAS loci. Here again is the QR code to take you to that list of genes. And we did a deep dive at one of those 20 loci, uh, focusing on CalCoCo2 as a novel regulator of insulin homeostasis, and we've shown that this is through autophagy. And we've got a lot of new data, um, which isn't quite ready for uh, prime time yet, that really goes in more to the mechanism of how CalCoCo is regulating uh, granules in uh, beta cells. So... The final part of my talk, and we move now to data that is all unpublished, is that I want to share with you something that I'm really excited about. I think maybe five years ago, I didn't think we'd get to the point where we had sufficient numbers of donors that it would be possible for us to uh, contemplate doing this experiment. So we're going to turn things on their head now, and rather than starting at a GWAS signal and trying to work out the effector transcript, we're going to really take cellular phenotypes and try and work out what are the genetic variants that uh, underlie that different cellular phenotype. So I like to think of this as a GWAS in a dish because rather than genotyping people in the room, we're going to genotype their islets that we have received from uh, Patrick McDonnell and his wonderful team in Alberta. And this really is a team effort and it wouldn't be possible without any of uh, it, if we lost any of the people on this slide. So Patrick and his uh, team in Alberta, James does all of the islet isolations, uh, and then Alia, Joss, and uh, Nancy have been responsible for characterizing that tissue in Patrick's lab. Jess is a, a bioinformatician uh, at McGill, uh, who's been involved in helping us with making this data publicly available. A collaboration with James Johnson and Yelena Kovec at UBC, they've been helping us with the phenotyping and also the mass spec. 
uh, a postdoc uh, who's now an independent uh, investigator, Jason Torres from Oxford. Uh, the team at Stanford, particularly Seth Sharp and Han Sun. And a long-standing collaborator, uh, and I'm sure a, a friend and colleague of Dr. Collins as well, Andrew Morris from uh, uh, the UK, who is a statistical geneticist and has been uh, involved in many of the type 2 diabetes GWAS studies uh, thus far. So first of all, let me tell you about our toolbox. So uh, as I said, for over 10 years, we've been assembling a human islet multi ohm to uh, toolbox. And this really is a partnership with Patrick McDonald. He is responsible for the uh, isolation of the islets and setting this up. We've really contributed on the omic side. So the pancreases uh, go to Edmonton, islets are isolated by James Leon, and then Alia and uh, other members of Pat's team set about to do very uh, detailed cellular phenotyping. Pat's love lab do static incubation on all the islets and patch clamping. And then uh, most recently, uh, the same islets have been sent to Jim Johnson and his lab at UBC, where he's performed perifusion on the same islets. For many years, first in Oxford and now at Stanford, my lab have been doing uh, genotyping, focusing on using ASNA tissue so we don't waste valuable uh, material from the islets. And then looking at putting down initially just transcriptomic data in bulk, uh, but more recently doing uh, chromatin state data through a TAC-seq, and with Jim Johnson doing the proteome by mass spec. And we have different numbers uh, of uh, uh, data available on different donors, depending on when those donors joined us in our multi-omic program. So I've really benefited for many years through establishing the collaboration with uh, Pat and being able to do lookups in this data, because quite often we would do an experiment in an endo CBTRH1 cell, or we would have a mouse model, and we'd want to know, well, does that get mirrored in humans? Do, do we see the same phenomena? And we've been able for many of the genes that we've worked on to go into this data set and to do lookups, which has been a wonderful way of really establishing the translational relevance of our discoveries. But we've always wanted to use this as a discovery resource. We thought, can we use this uh, uh, data set to identify novel variants that influence human islet function? And can we do this going genome wide? So I'm going to share with you some work in progress. Uh, most of this work uh, that I'm showing you on many of the slides was presented by Seth Sharp at the American Society of Human Genetics last November. Uh, we're about to uh, update it because we have more donors, um, but I'm sharing this data because it's the one that's most uh, ripe for prime time. So we started off our GWAS in a dish with 329 human uh, donors. Um, we had GCS phenotypes of insulin secretion and insulin content. Uh, we had the following covariants. And we've played around with a number of different ways of analyzing the data. Um, and we focused at the moment on Gemma rather than Regini. We think this works better with a small sample size. And we're using a linear mixed model. Uh, genotyping has been done on the Omni 2.5 plus exome with top med imputation, and here are minor allele frequency cutoffs and uh, LD cutoffs. So, uh, in terms of data, we have um, data, um, this is the GSIS data, we have perifusion data on 138 and exocytosis data on 184. So, we can look to see whether the signals that we found for static replicate in uh, these other uh, measures of islet function. We've been running on the side a sort of sanity check with a, um, a, 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 a score that Jason Torres developed called a tissue of action score. This is a way of trying to uh, work out whether or not a variant is working through a particular tissue. And we're kind of running this in the hope that when we find something, we have evidence to support it working through islet rather than it coming up as liver. Just again as a way when you've got such small samples of trying to be super uh, vigilant and cautious. We've also uh, been able then to uh, take our discoveries and to look at them in our multiomic data. So we and others, uh, including Steve Parker, Francis Collins, uh, and um, Michael Stitzel, have been assembling for many years large RNA-seq databases. And we've now got, uh, it's now actually close to 1,000 RNA-seq uh, samples from 1,000 donors. And we've got a tax seq on uh, 223 and mass spec on 138. So this is 206 unpublished for the attack seek, and we've got another 300 for the RNA seek. 
We can then bring into play wonderful data sets that have been generated from Carl Galton, from Jorge Ferrer, and from Klaus Kastner and Struan Grant that have looked at the looping between um, promoters and enhancers. So we can have this as an extra layer of uh, validation. And then, of course, we can do fine mapping and co-localization uh, to see whether any of the signals that we identify in the dish are the same signals that we found in the whole human being. And we can do this for a variety of different um, uh, traits. At the moment, we're focusing on type 2 diabetes. But of course, we can take this out to uh, data, including the wonderful data from Cassie, who's here in the audience. So let me show you how things are looking at the moment. I absolutely love this uh, circular Manhattan plot, and not just because it's pink. Um, if you look around the edge, you'll see the chromosome, and then you've got two Manhattan plots. In um, dark uh, pink, you have glucose-stimulated insulin secretion, and on the inside, you have got the insulin content. So if we take a very stringent p-value, we still have one signal for glucose-stimulated insulin uh, uh, secretion and 18 signals that are uh, at a slightly less stringent p-value. For the amount of insulin in the islets, we have 7 at a stringent p-value and 56 if we take it down to 5 times 10 to the minus 6. If we then go across to see how many of these signals uh, replicate in the exocytosis or the perifusion data, we have 10 of those signals that replicate for GSIS and 15 that replicate for total insulin content. So around the side here, we've put a few gene names on just to kind of orientate you, but I would like to just draw your attention, first of all, to three signals that are, uh, I think, very reassuring. Two in grey, because we happen to know that these are low cipher type 2 diabetes, and the PANCS uh, 2 lockers, because I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. Please, 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 oh, Mac to PC error there. Please, please, please note, though, that all of these are the nearest gene. I'm not presenting any of these as the underlying effector transcript, so uh, don't uh, get carried away. I want to make sure you realise that. But we are excited about the PANX2 locker. So this is our top signal. We have 10 variants in, uh, uh, in the signal in our credible set. And if you look at the effect size of carrying one of the risk alleles on uh, your insulin secretion, you can see that for every uh, allele that you have, you have a 5,460 picogram per mil increase in the amount of insulin that is secreted from your islets. I think our ability to detect this is based on the fact we've got a pretty attractive minor allele frequency here, which means we were well powered to see it. But it doesn't stop there. This is what gets me really excited. This signal was not only found as our top association meeting our stringent threshold, it replicates in our perifusion data when we look at the area under the curve for insulin at six millimolar glucose. We have an islet genomic EQTL, and we have an islet proteomic PQTL. So the same variant that alters uh, how much insulin you uh, release also alters how much of the selenoprotein and the selenotranscript you have in your islets. Um, if you look at FIWOS in the AMP CMD portal, you can see that there is evidence for this SNP having an association with HbA1c and, interestingly, fasting proinsulin. Looking over here, if you look at when we line up some of the data, here's our credible set. You can see that one of the variants in the credible set sits in open chromatin. It sits in an islet enhancer based on uh, K3, uh, K, H3, K27 acetylation. If you look at single cell uh, attack seek, I think this is fascinating. It's only in beta cells, not in alpha cells. Uh, and it's also located to an antisense uh, RNA. So really intriguing biology here. And I think some compelling uh, evidence to be very optimistic that Seleno is worth going after in the lab. So if I bring this together just to show you what we're kind of working on at the moment, we think we've got evidence that points to reducing seleno expression and reducing uh, uh, protein levels, altering insulin secretion. So we've got a direction of effect here, which again is really uh, helpful. I think it's also useful to note that the neighbouring gene, PANX2, which is the one that we kind of labelled it on originally, we've got no uh, EQTL, chromatin QTL or PQTL, and I think we've got pretty well-powered uh, uh, sample sizes for that. 
So I'm sure many in the room are thinking, well, that was a big uh, sample set for uh, co-localization with your RNA-seq. How has that changed our understanding of effector transcripts? And I put this slide together yesterday and had great fun doing it, thinking, gosh, back in the days when we first put the data together, we had 118, and we thought that was a lot. We didn't do any formal co-localization in this first paper. We were just like, are the signals in LD, and are they sitting over an islet enhancer? We found a few um, that were obviously anecdotal because they weren't formally tested. And actually, ZMIS, which is the one depicted here, we've been able to go on in mouse models and show is doing real biology. But I think we really changed things when we came together uh, with other groups. This was a wonderful collaboration. Uh, Francis was involved in this, Steve Parker, Michael Stitzel, many of you uh, uh, in the room. And we brought together our data, uh, plus data from the University of Lund with uh, Leif Group, uh, and we ran everything through a common pipeline. And in doing that, we uh, shift things to, um, if you counted both methods that we use, coloc and RTC, to having 46 uh, e-genes and 47 signals. Pretty much in parallel, there was another effort we were involved in, Leif and myself, with colleagues in Europe. Uh, this brought in uh, 200 and uh, odd samples from PISA. Uh, and this took this up to a similar number of 49 uh, signals. So where are we now with 835 signals? Well, hand put these numbers together for us. We've got 183 EQTLs, 153 in novel. And this is by doing, this time, the co-localization with SUSY. Um, we've tried to look at some of the intersection with the data sets that have been previously reported to see which ones are, uh, are completely novel and which ones uh, have been picked up in earlier uh, sets. And I think what's different in this set is we've got just shy of 300 new, uh, never published before, uh, uh, samples. Uh, our chromatin QTL is also looking pretty hopeful. Uh, the scores on the border at the moment are 328 chromatin QTLs, and we've got 34 of those co-localizing with the type 2 diabetes GWAS signal. And protein QTLs, which I'm just, I think this is so serendipitous that uh, these were measured by Jim for a completely different reason, and we've been able to integrate data by collaborating. We've identified 328 PQTLs, 34 of these also co-localize with a GWAS signal. And of course, now we've got the delight of being able to bring all of these data sets together and start to see, can we link open chromatin to transcript to protein? Uh, and this is something that's very much a work in progress, and I look forward to sharing with you at a later date. So what are some of our next steps? Well, we are expanding our group. I mentioned we get about 50 preps per year. Uh, we have a meta-analysis through a collaboration uh, with a wonderful surgeon at Maryland who's give, uh, collaborating with us with an additional 200 samples that have been uh, genotyped using a similar platform, and we have GSIS data on. And we're looking to have independent replication in a couple of HERN resources that I'm involved in, the uh, Human Islet Genotyping Initiative that I lead for the IIDP and HPAP. And of course, as I've mentioned, there's a lot of ongoing analysis with these very rich data sets that we're only just starting uh, uh, to uh, uh, get going on. We, I, one of the beautiful things about giving a talk is when you go somewhere completely different. And I was in Dallas the other week. And after my talk, um, someone came up to me and said, do you know, Anna, I know who the world expert is on Celino O. Um, so on the back of that presentation, I've now got the pleasure of collaborating with uh, Andrew Sri-Latha from uh, UT Southwestern. Uh, she had a beautiful paper several years ago looking at amylation with Celino O, and she has the knockout mouse. So we're working with her now to do follow-up. And Tamada has been working on uh, both Pan uh, PANKS2 and uh, um, uh, Celino in our beta cell models. So to summarize the last part of my talk, uh, I've shared with you a, a large multi-omic human islet data set uh, that we've generated and have been able to couple with deep cellular phenotyping that's been generated by others. Uh, we've performed what we think is uh, the first GWAS in a dish for islet function, and I hope I've convinced you that we're thinking very carefully about our robust replication pipeline. And I hope I've also shown you the power of integrating genetics with islet multiomic data and the, the way this uh, gives us the ability to identify effector transcripts and critically understand direction of effect. Some final thoughts. These are two of the more uh, worrying representations of scientists. Um, I do like the concept here of dyeing things pink, but I am worried about the direction of the dye. Uh, and over here, um, uh, yeah, no comment. 
Okay, take home messages. So the first part of my talk was about a deep dive at a single locus. Uh, we uh, went through coding, the coding variant PAX4 and looked at how it reduces beta cell function in carriers, how uh, we end up with increased numbers of bihormonal cells and that these cells have evidence for metabolic defects. The second part was looking at cellular phenotyping at scale. And I shared with you our genome-wide CRISPR loss of function screen in human beta cells, where we identified 580 genes influencing uh, insulin secretion, including our new favorite, CalCoCo2. And then the last part of my talk was really trying to share with you some of the ways that we're looking to discover new regulators of insulin secretion by performing a GWAS in a dish for insulin secretion and integrating this with islet multi-omics. So I'd like to uh, wrap up by thanking my wonderful team uh, back at Stanford, uh, here depicted on this uh, recent uh, lab outing, the PAX4 team, the uh, genome uh, CRISPR screen, the GWAS and a dish buddies, my wonderful colleagues in uh, the AMPS EMD, um, and if you want the UR, uh, QR codes for the podcast or the gene list, they're here, and a huge thanks to all of my funders and particularly to the donors and their families for access to the human islet material. Thank you. So thanks very much uh, for a fascinating presentation with multiple components. Uh, we're open for Q&A, and again, if you're in the room and want to ask a question, there are microphones in the aisles, please use those. If you're listening virtually and want to pose a question, just put, punch it into the Q&A, and uh, we will try to coordinate all of this. Questions? Thank you, Anna. Um, so many, yeah, as, as expected, uh, fantastic stuff. Um, I'm, I have a couple questions, but maybe I'll just start off with one and then let others and then. Um, so have you thought at all about event, the GWAS in a dish work? Um, how you might apply that eventually to figure out maybe subtypes of diabetes or classify, um, you know, there's going to be a subset of type 2 diabetes uh, associated alleles that are actually manifesting through these kind of phenotypes that you're measuring, but others might be in other tissues, and how you might start to bring all of that together. Yeah, that's a really interesting question, and I have those data, but for the interests of time, I couldn't... Um, include them. Um, so we've done partitioned risk scores on um, all of the islet phenotypes. Um, and reassuringly, we do see that if we look at the clusters that are um, denoting islet cell function, we see a higher effect of those clusters on and a stronger association in beta for, um, uh, for, for both, well, the three clusters. And we've done this with Miriam Adler's first clusters, and we've now just done it with the ones that came out the other week in um, Nature Medicine. And her new clustering improves our p-values and effect sizes. So we definitely see evidence that the beta cell variants work through the islets, which is reassuring, yes. <laughs> Next question. So you, um, you outlined a lot of great next steps for the um, GWAS in a dish and multiomic data set, but I was wondering if you thought about or what your plans are for next steps for your CRISPR screen approach, because it looked like the limiting, a huge limiting factor is the, the number of cells that you need, and it seems like based on the pictures you included, that's going to be a hard thing to overcome. So I'm wondering if you guys are, you know, what you're thinking about in terms of next steps for that approach, and if there's a path to do something in the way of meta-analysis across experiments or how you can get to a point where you have more power mm -hmm. um, to dig into. Because you suggested, you know, you probably did have more results, but, you know, we're conservative in interpreting those findings. Yeah, so really great question. So I remember p presenting the CRISPR screen quite early on. And um, I think a lot of people in the field were trying to work out whether or not it was worth it going genome-wide. And I have to say that I would be very hesitant at, to go back and do another genome-wide screen. Before that screen, we did do a targeted screen of 300 genes at 75 loci for five different cellular phenotypes. And um, I think our hit rate from that was better. Um, and 
And what we're doing currently through the Accelerated Medicines Partnership is we have worked very hard to define a list of potential effector transcripts. I think being more systematic than we were with the list that I showed previously and then looking to deploy it uh, across multiple cell types with multiple different cellular readouts and then to bring those data together to be able to be um, in a better position to talk about pleiotrophy. After all, we know we might see a cis-EQTL in multiple uh, tissues, but does that give rise to a disease-causing phenotype? So I think the way I see it now is I, will, I would like to approach this in a more targeted manner to do deeper phenotyping and to have targeted screens of varying sizes. I just don't think I need to do 18,000 in one go. There's a question from the virtual audience. Um, of the 580 some genes that you found in the CRISPR eye screen that influence insulin, how many of them directly or indirectly affect the insulin gene and its transcription? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, I don't think I can give a, um, an accurate answer to that. I can say that insulin obviously comes up as one of our hits, and there are a number of transcription factors that we know regulate it. Um, if you do a pathway analysis again, we'll see an enrichment for MODI genes, enrichment for type 2 diabetes. But I don't think we've gone in and done um, any formal assessment um, to give you a, 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 an accurate number on that. Also a question about the first example you gave of PAX4, which is just lovely, taking it all apart and getting down to the nitty gritty. Would you predict that a gain of function mutation in ARX would have the same phenotype? Ooh. One would think in mice it does. So um, in, in mice, if you um, lose it out, you see the opposite phenotype. So they haven't made a gain of function in a mouse, but the loss of function has the thing. So yeah, I would, I would, I would think it'd be hard to test though, because we don't, None of our differentiation protocols um, force you to the alpha. We make alpha cells, but not. I don't know how good we would be at um, testing would, it. Would that, though, in a human phenotype be associated with diabetes? Might it pop up if we screen everybody in the world who has glucose yeah. not quite properly maintained? Yes. I mean, I'm sure we'll have those data at some point to, uh, <laughs> to check. Absolutely. Great. Question. Hi, Anna. Nice to see you. Um, it was a great talk. Uh, I think I have two questions. The first one is more, I guess, you know, terminology. Um, so I was trying to understand why you call the GWAS in a dish a GWAS, because you, you don't really have case and controls, right? And then, like, you're really measuring the phenotypes uh, of, of the islets. And then you talked about, like, FIWAS. So, like, w what is the difference really here? Okay. Like, I don't know. Is okay. it? Is it uh, I, as someone, for, for those of us who are struggling with these, okay. you know, terms, I was wondering if you could. No problem. Uh, Let's, so, so you can do a genome-wide association study on a quantitative trait. You don't have to just do one on a case control. So in this instance, we're looking at insulin secretion as a quantitative trait. In the same way that we might do a GWAS on uh, fasting glucose levels in the population or HbA1c, well, both of those are examples of quantitative traits, or BMI. So um, you can say GWAS. The dish is because um, we're looking at the cellular function, uh, and if you like, my people are in a dish, rather than them being uh, something I've measured with an oral glucose tolerance test or an IVGTT. The FIWAS, um, I love doing a FIWAS. It's a really neat way of trying to... Um, gain extra information on something that you've discovered. So there's so much publicly available data now, and many of it, and much of it has been put into the knowledge portal, and it's a wonderful resource, and I would strongly encourage you to uh, use that as a screening ple pleasure rather than uh, social media. It's a wonderful place. Just go in, put your favorite gene in, and you can take a variant that you know is associated with type 2 diabetes, and you can say, I wonder if that variant is associated with anything else. And it can help you because if you start to see that a variant is associated with body mass index, waist hip circumference, um, as well as diabetes, it might make you think that that variant is likely to be working through uh, a mechanism in uh, adipocytes or in the brain rather than it working through the beta cell. You'll also, if you're thinking about something in terms of its drug ability, if you start to see it's having effects in tissues where there might be undesirable effects, um, that's good to know. So a FIWAS is taking a variant and looking across at the phenotypes. A GWAS is taking the genetic variant. I hope that makes sense. 
Yeah, sort of. Uh, 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 so the other question is about, uh, I, as you know, my lab, uh, we, we focus on uh, characterizing the pancreas enhancers. And, um, and I think in the enhancer field, it is, uh, re uh, is well accepted that um, set, you know, uh, most genes are regulated by multiple enhancers, right, in, in the, especially in mammalian genomes. So um, are there any efforts to, like, is, isn't it plausible that, you know, that you have these variants and they all have small effects, but together they actually have a bigger effect? Like, what kind of, I mean, I, I, I do know about, like, the polygenic, you know, there's these efforts with polygenic risk scores and whatnot to sort of combine all of these things together. but. Do you have any plans in terms of like having a computational approaches to maybe tackle this uh, complexity? So I, I think that's a really interesting question. It's, it's not an area that my lab has um, expertise in or is, is working on, but I know others are. And within the Accelerated Medicines Partnership, uh, we've recently funded uh, an opportunity pool grant to Heike Kim in Chicago, who's developed some really nice computational approaches at looking at transcription factor motifs and the impact of variants. Other people like Jesse Ingritz and Ansel Kanjaji have also been working on um, uh, computational methods and tools that might go down that route. So I think, yeah, other people are doing that, but it's not something that um, uh, we're working on. That relates to a question coming in from the web about how, do you have anything you can say about epistatic effects, which everybody has hoped eventually we would start to be able to dissect out of all these analyses, and it's obviously very difficult because of power. Is there anything to say there about that? Yeah, I, I think um, it would be great if we, we were better equipped to, to, to do that. I still think that a, some of the better ways to start looking would be to work in monogenic families and to look at rare variants and to look at uh, common variant interactions. I just think that might be a, uh, an easier place to start, um, but it's not something we're doing. More of a modifier yeah. of a monogenic yeah. condition. I think probably the last question, because I know we've run over, but please. Um, so just a bit more on the, the PAX4 study. So what do you think is actually happening in, in patients with the risk allele? Are they having, like, starting off life with fewer beta cells? Or, like, how do you, how do you think that that's actually manifesting inside, inside people, the effects that you've found? Yeah, no, that's, I, I think you're on the money there. That would be my hypothesis. It's very hard to measure pancreatic beta cell mass in a living human, unfortunately. One of those things that's still up there is a holy grail that we would love to be able to do. Um, one of the interesting observations, if you remember, all of the individuals we studied were non-diabetic. And um, our uh, risk carriers who are non-diabetic are insulin sensitive. And I, said, I think that, to me, I make sense of that, that they have managed to cope with having um, uh, their risk allele and remain non-diabetic because they are insulin sensitive. So they're meeting demand. So if you're born with fewer beta cells or uh, beta cells that are um, polyhormonal, they're going to work for some time until you perhaps go through puberty or perhaps where you're pregnant or something else happens that is that trigger that means you can no longer meet the insulin secretory demand. Um, so that would be my hypothesis, but very, very hard to show that in a, a living human. Well, thank you, all the people who asked questions, but thank you especially to our speaker. Let us please uh, give thanks again to Professor Cloyne. Thank you.